Session 5, it is going to be held under the topic of UNCLOS as an Access of Marine Protection Norms. Judge Maria Teresa Infant Coffey from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea will moderate this session. She is joining us online. Judge Coffey, do you hear me? I can hear you very well. Okay, thank you. The floor yes. is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, this is a good morning in Chile, good evening everywhere, and especially in Seoul. And it is a great honor to moderate this panel today. Uh, various angles of the marine protection in contemporary practice will be addressed by uh, some distinguished panelists. Uh, I am going to uh, identify and introduce everyone. Two words about the subject of the panel. Marine protection, marine environment, and the new emerging contingencies subject matter of this panel. Litter and microplastic pollution, energy, and the setting up of regulations and uh, new key chapters of the law of the sea. Marine protection norms, which are crafted in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, must respond to new scenarios. These scenarios are characterized by the relationship with the consequences of activities considered as valid, but insufficiently regulated or assessed in the past. Due diligence and uncertainty related to it is supposed to make an important contribution in this respect. A very encouraging set of subjects, and we expect to have a fair number of conclusions to inspire our future work. And with this, I'm, I'm I'm going to introduce uh, my panelists and discussants. Professor Gavunelli, Maria Gavunelli, who is Associate Professor of International Law at the Faculty of Law at Athens Public International Law Center and uh, at the Capodistrian University of Athens. Uh, and she is Senior Policy Advisor and member of the Hellenistic Foundation for European Foreign Policy. Director Nilfur Oral, who is also attending uh, uh, from distance uh, and is uh, currently director of the Center of International Law at the National University of Singapore. A member of International Law Commission, congratulations for your re-election and uh, co-chair of the study group on sea level rise in relation to international law. Dr. Alice Olino, who is a postdoctoral fellow in public international law at the University of Milano Bicocca, and, and his uh, first monograph is upcoming and will be published by Cambridge University Press next year. And two distinguished discussants, uh, Dr. Omri Sender, uh, who is an, a very well-known international law practitioner and scholar. He serves as counsel to states in international dispute settlement proceedings and Dr. B. Byung Lee from Yonsei University, where he nowadays is uh, teaching. He has also taught at the Seoul National University, the Catholic University of Korea, Kwangwon University, and Chongbuk National University. The, our meeting will last until 8 p.m. in Seoul time, and I would like to explain before giving the floor to the panelists that uh, each a participant will uh, have 15 minutes or if uh, she uh, uh, or he would like to have more uh, time, that would be perfect. Uh, maybe the discussants would like to speak shorter and then to have a second round of uh, exchanges uh, among the panelists and uh, maybe I, I can raise a question to animate a little bit the discussion. With this, I'm very glad to uh, leave you with uh, Professor Maria Gabunelli, who is the first speaker, and she will be uh, speaking about new forms of energy at sea. Maria, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Judge Cafe. It's always uh, a pleasure to see old friends, and this panel has a number of new and old friends. Um, I would like to um, uh, reiterate my thanks uh, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Korean Society of International Law for their most kind invitation. It is really such a pleasure to be able to travel again uh, after such a long time 
um, and even uh, in the throes of the Omicron variant, uh, it is still very, very pleasurable uh, to see, uh, to be around. Um, I would spend the remaining of my few minutes with you in talking about new forms of energy at sea. Uh, there is a question mark at the end of that. And that question mark really it comes to both the new and the forms as well. And uh, the reason is very, very clear. Uh, in the Glasgow Climate Pact that was just concluded this uh, past few days, and incidentally is a non-binding resolution, so the pact does not really mean that we do have a new convention or anything like that. Um, there is this um, infamous paragraph 36 uh, that uh, many tears have been shed on. Uh, and that paragraph 36 calls upon parties to accelerate the development, deployment, and dissemination of technologies and the adoption of policies to transition towards low emission energy systems, including by rapidly scaling up the deployment of clean power generation and energy efficiency measures. Clean power generation is going to happen mostly at sea. And when we're talking about mostly at sea, we're talking to the tune of almost 90% at sea. So that clearly uh, presents us with a number of questions of new challenges, if you like, that we need to address if we would like to understand what is ahead of us. And actually, I'm not so sure whether it's ahead of us, so it's already here, already this year, uh, even at the time of the pandemic, we do have an amazing surge in offshore energy um, installations. Incidentally, please compare the relevant obligation under the Paris Agreement, which re refers to enhanced deployment of renewable energy, but rather in, in human rights terms more than anything else. So let's go back to energy. And what it is that we're talking about, we're talking about offshore installations that come in different shapes and forms, uh, more traditional ideas, offshore installations of the type that we all know about, or pipelines, and renewable sources uh, of energy, windmills, wave turbines, these kind of things. There are two things that are common to all these traditional or non-traditional types. First, they're interconnected. Uh, the little uh, photo up there would tell you that even if you have a traditional offshore installation, you would still need to have it collected, uh, connected to something else. And if you have uh, a windmill or wave turbine, you would still need to transfer to the mainland whatever kind of uh, energy you're going to generate. So uh, interconnection. And second, using cables for interconnection you're actually talking about something which is not entirely what we had originally talked about. Cables these days is rather more complicated an exercise than the original cables we were talking about back in the 1884 uh, convention um, in, uh, on the telegraphic cable between uh, New York and Paris, which was the first convention on cables ever attempted. And here again, we have a number of base rules, if you like, uh, the fundaments of the system. Uh, the fundaments of the system would simply explain the allocation of jurisdiction. And that is fairly simple in the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, you would have uh, the coastal state in the EZ and the territorial sea. Uh, you would have the flag state in the high seas, although there is a question as to who is going out there in the high seas to build a very expensive uh, offshore installation, but still. And you also have a number of other issues. Um, you usually have a single focal point. Um, so the coastal state would have regulatory powers, enforcement powers. The coastal state would be also responsible for any pollution caused. So uh, responsibility and liability would also attach to that single state. Um, replace coastal with flag state for anything that is beyond areas of national jurisdiction. Um, and uh, also add a little footnote. If you're talking about um, 
pipelines, uh, by definition, you have a situation that goes beyond a single jurisdiction. A pipeline starts from one place to go to another place and usually crosses several other places in between. So therein, you do have an exception to this single jurisdictional point. Um, there is also a, a, a number of other common concerns, among them uh, environmental requirements, requirements that apply to the placement, but also the operation of such uh, installations. Um, and you would not be surprised to realize that there is a fair number of such regulations for more traditional forms of uh, um, inter installations, oil and gas installations and pipelines, but much, much, much less even non-existent for anything more sophisticated and modern. And of course, we need also to take into consideration that you regard obligations as compared to other uses of the seas, um, navigation, fisheries, tourism, uh, environmental concerns. I'll come back to that uh, and discuss them a bit more. So let's... Um, take a walk on the wild side of energy, starting with the more traditional um, kind of forms. And therein, uh, we're talking really about exploration and exploitation for oil and gas. And we are also need to think, if we're going to talk about a single jurisdiction and the allocation of jurisdictional roles, don't we really mean that we need to have a prerequisite here? And perhaps that prerequisite could be the limitation, which is the ultimate way in which you can actually organize um, yourselves uh, 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 in, in the marine uh, area. And I'm going to use two different options to explore the possibilities. One, option one, is the situation where you really need to pursue further uh, oil and gas um, exploration and exploitation, pretty much along the traditional lines, but not only. Uh, and then um, uh, let's, let's see how the system works or it doesn't work. And then uh, we'll explore second option B, which is something that would see more and more in the future. So option one, the limitation agreements. And um, uh, my first example would be the Cyprus agreements. Um, three agreements concluded by the Republic of Cyprus in the Eastern Mediterranean with Egypt, Lebanon, and Israel. Why are they interesting for our purposes? Because they're really the same text. It's almost copy paste. Um, uh, Egypt and Lebanon are parties to the law of the Sea Convention. Israel is not. So there was a replacement or rather uh, the omission of one word in the text of the agreements, uh, whereas in the first two it says according to the law of the sea convention, in the Israeli agreement it says according to the law of the sea. The presumption being that uh, Israel accepts that uh, whatever is written in the law of the sea convention is actually customary law as well. Uh, the agreements are again fairly simple, uh, straightforward, median line with minor adjustments, uh, almost nothing. And they have generated an enormous amount of activity. Uh, these are the blocks on the left side uh, promulgated by Egypt, on the right side the, the blocks, um, the, the license is already offered by um, Cyprus. Um, there is a framework agreement between the parties in implementation of the delimitation uh, convention. That framework agreement covers the situation of cross-median line um, uh, hydrocarbon resources, these, these reservoirs that are on the line and underneath Ashval uh, of, of uh, the delimitation line. Um, the uh, agreement was concluded almost immediately and has been uh, in, in force ever since and apparently it works perfectly well. Um, if that is the perfect example, the same agreement with Lebanon did not work at all. And did not work at all, why? Because there were always discussions that the subsequent agreement with Israel might actually impinge upon uh, the common border with Lebanon, uh, all kinds of political issues ensued. Uh, this triangular situation, there, this, this sort of area 
is the, the bone of contention. And you can see the different approaches. Uh, bottom line, uh, the convention with uh, Lebanon has never into, entered into force in spite of the fact that the Lebanese government is trying to organize licenses and whatnot. Um, but the agreement with Israel seems to be working fairly well. So much so that there is also intense activity on the Israeli side as well. And here you see the blocks on the Israeli side of the delimitation border. Uh, there is also in this agreement an obligation for a framework utilization agreement pretty much along the lines of the agreement between Cyprus and Egypt. Here, however, it appears to, to, become, to, to have a hiccup. Um, there seems to be a, an issue uh, with the Aphrodite Yeshai Reservoir, which you can see up there on the left-hand side, as you see. Um, the, two, the two sides have not really managed to figure out a way to work together in this particular area. What is very interesting, though, is that they do not consider that an interstate dispute, but rather they have chosen to push that thing further away from the state, make it uh, a commercial issue, and send it to arbitration between the companies involved rather than the states involved. And because the thing takes some time, there's been a recent agreement, um, a, a letter jointly signed by the ministers of energy of both parties, in which they have given the companies 180 days to come up uh, with a solution. If not, the two states would actually uh, pick it up and see whether the system works or not. So there you are. You do have three different agreements, um, exactly the same in essence. Uh, with three different ways uh, in which you can approach the situation. There's also another set uh, of agreements in that same area. Um, the difference here is pretty obvious to the eye. There is a, a, a very short uh, red line that is the uh, delimitation agreement between Turkey and Libya, and there's a rather longer blue line, which is the delimitation agreement between Greece and Egypt. Uh, the practitioners in the room would certainly salivate because that's a dispute that awaits an out-of-the-box kind of arrangement. Um, conciliation, something different, I just let it be there, but you can see obviously the kind of problem that would uh, emerge. Let's explore Option two, however. Uh, option two really goes beyond exploration and exploitation and moves into a freezing of such exploration and exploitation to the benefit of the marine environment and indeed also uh, climate change. Here, I do have two examples. Again, the first one uh, is the aftermath of a dispute that was simmering for quite some time between um, France and Spain in the Gulf de Leon. And um, uh, there was you know, an attempt to delimitate the area, uh, which somehow was not moving ahead. Um, and eventually, and that is very interesting because that comes again in, in the aftermath of our, of our previous uh, panel on climate change, um, the French side decided at some point that uh, they would ban all drilling for oil and gas by 2040. Uh, there would be uh, no new permits granted and existing permits would actually stop at 2040. That means that there was absolutely no reason to pursue any further exploration and exploitation in the Gulf de Leon and as a result the area was declared off limits. On the Spanish side, they reciprocated and all the permits issued already for that particular area were revoked by a ministerial decision. And the two parties jointly uh, requested uh, UNEP-MAP, the Mediterranean Action Plan, 
to declare that area uh, a special protected area of Mediterranean importance as PAMI, and that is indeed the Mediterranean Cetacean Migration Corridor. Why? Because there are whales that go up and down that particular area. So there you see immediately how you would actually reconcile um, exploration and exploitation of natural resources with the whaling or, or the, the, the whales moving up and down. So protection uh, against, uh, as uh, uh, against exploration and exploitation. Um, I'm not touching upon issues pertaining to compensation for permits already given. I'm not touching upon issues pertaining to the decommissioning of existing platforms. That was not the case in the Gulf of Leon, but elsewhere it would be the case. And there's no question that we need to address these kind of issues. Um, the, 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 the seeds of the solution exist in the Law of the Sea Convention, but they need to be adjusted uh, to the circumstances and especially to the bill. And you would see the, these kind of challenges also emerging in the new commitments that come uh, again in the Mediterranean in the aftermath of the IUCN World Conservation Pro uh, Congress uh, this past uh, September. Uh, for instance, uh, Greece has undertaken a complete delignatization of the system. Lignite is our local coal. That means that uh, we have all the coal mines would close by 2028, which is the day after tomorrow and uh, all the islands would be interconnected so that as to avoid uh, using fuel, fossil fuel for, to generate um, electricity. Uh, there would also be 30% of the sea areas set aside as marine protected areas by 2030 and 10% of the sea areas set aside as fisheries no-take uh, reserves again by 2030. How would you reconcile these kind of situations with exploration and exploitation for oil and gas in the area and the delimitation discussions that we have? Uh, question mark. Uh, there is a climate bill uh, before the Greek parliament as we speak. The bill does not contain um, a, a total ban equivalent to the Plan Climat of, of uh, the French Republic. Um, it would be interesting to see what's going on. And incidentally, uh, the UE uh, Green Finance Taxonomy, which is the regulation that pays for all that and is actually under discussion as we speak, may, may provide for transition status only to gas investments with an extremely low emissions footprint. Uh, I would like to remind you that uh, all uh, gas is going to be the transition element. Um, which really gives us the opportunity to move into the next phase. And here we're talking about wave-generated power and solar power. They both require space, lots of space, to expand. Um, and also wind power. Um, uh, we had a record year in 2021 uh, for the generation of electricity uh, by wind power. Um, the renewable production in the European Union will move exponentially from 23 gigawatts to 60 by 2030 and 300 by 2050. We're talking about serious money and serious investment, as you might well imagine. Almost all of that would be offshore. So again, you realize the kind of issues that we're uh, looking at. Uh, Japan is following along. Um, and Africa has a bonanza waiting for it because apparently uh, there are three energy communities waiting to work along those lines. 90% of whatever it is they're going to do would be offshore. And that really brings me to the requirements and prerequisites for this kind of uh, activities. I would argue that the very first thing one has to do is somehow figure out what kind of uses of the seas are going to be impacted upon. And then you have to designate that particular uses of the sea. So you need old and new tools, really, to work with. Uh, a new tool, which is new quotation marks, 
would be uh, the marine spatial planning. Um, the EU directive that uh, has provided for it has already done wonders uh, in the uh, northern side of uh, the EU waters, in the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. But the spatial planning in the Mediterranean is just starting. Um, in the same way, we can talk about uh, area-based management tools, the discussion that we've heard earlier, which also expand into the high seas, which is not the case uh, with the marine special planning tool. So, again, we need to start talking about MPAs, marine protected areas, the ones that Dan Bodansky was talking about, keeping in mind, of course, that the designation of the area and the designation of the applicable measures are actually two steps that do not go side by side. So it is absolutely reasonable to have a marine protected area where some kind of renewable activity may be allowed, whereas oil and gas exploration and exploitation may not, for instance. So it's slightly more subtle than the blanket prohibition that one would uh, presume to have. And then once you have actually designated the uses of the seas, then you need to balance them out. And that, again, requires uh, the use of particular tools. For instance, in navigation, you already see an example of uh, a, a, an attempt at the IMO level um, uh, spearheaded by the UK and the Netherlands to organize navigation around offshore uh, uh, platforms, especially wind um, turbines and things like that, and uh, you would need also to have environmental impact assessment involved with the consultation of all shareholders, define all, who are these shareholders, in order to figure out what we are going to do uh, in terms of fishing, tourism and prospecting. Uh, these are examples of marine spatial planning so that you can see how detailed um, they are in this particular situation. But uh, the bit I'd love more is actually the more futuristic element. Um, methane hydrates. Um, the, the crystals that you see up there, they provide the complete combustion that we have all thinking about. So when they ignite, uh, they burn absolutely without residue. So here we're talking about a pure source of energy that may be found in the depths of the sea. We didn't even know that they existed before 1964. We had never identified them. Nowadays, we do know that they provide the, the perfect energy source. They are very deep down. They are 99% offshore. Um, we have bits and pieces of that in the Mediterranean and in other parts of the world. The real effort is actually being made by Japan. Japan has started really using uh, some of those uh, crystals already by, uh, since 2013 and, and is in the middle of a major uh, project to identify more. Um, we'll hear more about methane crystals. Need I remind you that methane is also uh, one of those uh, climate change um, uh, gases that would be of interest here. The way to the future. It's all there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. It has been so enlightening and so attractive that I'm sure that we will have uh, further discussions on the subject.